Welcome to another uh, live session of our lecture, Successful Negotiation and uh, Communication. Last time we talked about the uh, self-esteem and how important it is for proper and sophisticated communication. Um, basically, uh, we said that everybody um, has got, of course, a self-esteem. He or she wants to protect or wants to improve. And uh, if communication is happening in such a way that the self-esteem is being threatened, um, is being negatively exposed, uh, in particular in front of others or peers or superiors, um, then communication suffers. And it's very, very difficult. Um, once you have a, a negative impact uh, for the communication uh, process, because the other one feels like his self-esteem is under attack, um, then it is difficult to go uh, into into a positive direction again. Let me let me explain that. Um, so if I paint it on the um, here on this uh, on this blackboard, um, it is a bit like uh, playing billiard, playing uh, a game of pool billiard. Um, so you have to imagine this is the, um, the the table here with this different kind of uh, pockets. And um, we are playing with the uh, with a white ball here. And once a ball is getting into a certain kind of direction, it is a nice metaphor. Um, it is very easy to run to the side and give the ball another impulse um, to the left or to the right hand side. But what is very, very uh, complicated is to run to the other side of the table and then give the ball an impulse into the opposite direction. So what I, what I mean with that is um, if the ball at the beginning initially at the communication process, at the negotiation is running into the wrong direction, if you have a, a bad start um, because the other one feels like he's or she's being criticized and he, his or her self-esteem is under attack, it is very, very, very difficult to get back on track and uh, to lead and um, direct the communication process into a positive direction. So that is, um, that is meant by that. It is a nice um, metaphor. I like that um, because it uh, perfectly illustrates and how far the self-esteem is important in the communication process. So everything we said, everything we do, we do ultimately consciously or unconsciously to obtain, defend or improve our self-esteem. So it is always optimal when, communi when communicating and negotiating to be aware of the self-esteem of others and not to attack the self-esteem of others. And people are very sensitive. Like uh, Professor Schulz von Thun mentioned earlier, and we discussed that when we discussed the four-sided model of communication of Schulz von Thun, um, it is very, people are very, very sensitive on the relationship level. You remember again the, um, the iceberg model of uh, communication. Let me quickly um, sum it up again. So we said that there are two people communicating. It can be visualized. We can have the analogy metaphor um, of an iceberg. And uh, this is um, what people are saying. This is basically um, what, pe what people statement. This is the factual level, the factual level. Um, so what is being said in the communication process? There's not not so much a, diff, uh, a misunderstanding here. So th this is about um, uh, an equal understanding of what is being said. But on the relationship level, on the relationship level, on the relationship level, um, the two icebergs meet first, and people are, are having an oversensitive ear. Um, at the relationship side. This is what uh, Schulz von Thun um, said as well, the relationship level. Therefore, I like this, uh, this kind of image. So um, attacking the self-esteem of the other person already occurs, already happens if you um, tell the other person, no, I disagree. This is not true. Um, uh, we, cannot, uh, we cannot see it like that. No, we have to take into consideration 
um, this and that kind of fact, right? So attacking the position of the other person is also uh, um, at a subconscious level attacking the self-esteem of the other person. So um, you have to be very, very diplomatic. So um, saying that the other person is wrong means on a psychological basis to attack his or her self-esteem. So what is always a more wise and more diplomatic and uh, also more successful way of communicating is um, that if somebody is having a point and saying, ah, your company did a bad job when um, you did this and that, right? Don't, don't say, ah, now you're exaggerating and in general it works, etc. But um, it is better to first try to understand where the other person is coming from to see the world through his or her uh, own eyes and perspective and say, um, I perfectly understand that you're worried and uh, I, I, I feel the same. And because of that, I would suggest to do this and that. Um, because you're really following up on what uh, is bothering the other person instead of just criticizing his or her position. So that is very, very important to understand that. And most people don't do that. Um, you can see that in the talk shows happening all the time um, because there's always an exchange of arguments. And it's okay to do that as long as uh, you know, the other person is not getting the feeling that he or she is attacked uh, when it comes to the self, uh, self-esteem. And um, yes. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So, oh, one moment, there is uh, one, I need to interrupt quickly because uh, there is somebody knocking on the door. <laughs> so, here we are again. Um, so, what my, my, my point is that it is always better, even if you, um, if you disagree with the position of some, some person, it is always um, better to first uh, show that you try to understand the other person. Uh, tell me about your problem. Tell me about your issues. What, what would you suggest before you criticize the other person's position? Um, because then, in this case, he or she will uh, feel like um, he or she is under attack. It's always good to follow up on uh, what is bothering the other person. Like, are you complaining um, that, um, I don't know, the supply or the, the, um, the reclamation or uh, that the communication was not working properly uh, with our sales representatives. And because of that, I ensure um, that, I don't know, our service department will be in touch uh, with you on a continuous basis in order to um, avoid any kind of uh, such issues in the near future. Something like that. And then the other person feels understood. And that is the most important thing. So factors that support the self-esteem. Um, accordance with one's conscious. So every act that complies with the internalized rules or prohibitions uh, that we are um, that we are taught will help to preserve the self-esteem. Any attack on such limits will automatically constitute an attack on the self-esteem. So everything that is not in line with the rules and prohibitions and morals and ethics and standards of one's person, of course is an attack on the self-esteem of the other person. Uh, every transgression of such rules and prohibitions weakens the self-esteem. And this is also what we need to avoid. So if we persuade somebody to do something that is not compatible with his conscious, we simultaneously on a psychological level attack his self-esteem. This is because this reaction coming from him will of necessity lead to a defense. So he tries to defend his self-esteem, whereby defense is conscious as a part of his personality. So um, we have to understand that, that every kind of disagreement um, may be seen from the other person as an attack on the self-esteem. That doesn't imply, the implication is not to always say that the other person you're talking to is always wrong. But the implication is that you, again, that you have to try to understand the world as being seen through his or her uh, perspective. And that is a big art. 
So, positive environmental responses to one's self-image. Um, confirmation that others see us as we wish to be seen. Um, and here we have this uh, psychological principle again of this self-affirmation. We believe ourselves to be in a certain kind of way. So we are not only making, as we said, an image of others, of political parties, persons, um, whatever, uh, or brands, but we are also creating an image of ourselves. And we, we act and interact in accordance to that image. Um, and this always, this contributes to the maintenance or improvement of the self-esteem, this affirmation. If for, it is happening in, in just normal, ordinary talks as well. So if, if somebody is saying, oh, you have a, um, what, what is that kind of um, CD like, you, or the, this kind of playlist you're having on, uh, on Spotify. I like, I, 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 I absolutely love that music. It is on, an, on a subliminal level, it is an affirmation and it is uh, heightening, it is improving my, uh, my self-esteem. I wouldn't say, say, say so in this, uh, in this very moment in time, but on a, sub, a subliminal level, on a subconscious level, this is exactly what is happening. So any proof of a discrepancy between our ideal image and the image that another suggests automatically constitutes an attack on the self-esteem. And any attack on the and here it should be self-esteem again always results in a, in a not okay feeling i'm sorry that i have to interrupt again uh, one moment please okay basically we discussed that um what i wanted to say uh, there was i think there was a question from uh, i realized that from uh, sandra or some some kind of remark it is important to act uh, the way you want to you want to feel yes and um, what is also a good, uh, a good tool in, um, in business life, sometimes, uh, and probably you heard about that before, uh, we have the option to do what we call a 360 degrees feedback. I don't know whether you ever heard about that, 360 um, degrees feedback. And the 360 degrees feedback is offered at some uh, corporations. For example, at Shell, you have that. Um, uh, and this plays an important role when it comes to um, the self-esteem, when it comes also how we are being seen uh, by others. Because we have uh, an image of ourselves and um, others see us in a different kind of light. So there may be a mismatch between um, how we see ourselves and how we are being seen by others. And in order to find out if there is a big gap or a mismatch, um, and it's a good feedback for yourself, um, there is a tool called 360 degrees feedback. Um, how is it? How is it working? Basically, um, it's called 360s, uh, 360 degrees feedback because you're getting feedback from all parts of the organization. So um, at Shell, we had different kind of competence planets. Um, when Pluto was uh, was still a planet, so we had the nine planets uh, model here. And um, we had, to, for example, different kind of competence areas. One was, for example, uh, motivates uh, coaches and develops. So that was uh, that was one coaches and develops. And then we had um, uh, one building a shared vision, for example. That that was another one, or analytical thinking. So, and each of the planets was um, subdivided into different kind of um, elements that constitute this um this planet this competence planet and then what you had to do first you have to uh assess yourself you have to do a self-assessment so you have to score um yourself as to each of the elements on a scale from one to five whereas five is the best five means you're a genius you're developing something new it was called develop new um so uh, i don't know i just score myself a three or a two or a four um, and then this, uh, not, not your assessment, it's not shared, um, so it's just kept private. Uh, however, what is, what is being done? Um, a 360 degrees feedback questionnaire is being sent to your peers, so your colleagues in the organization, so in your, um, in your line of business. It's sent to your boss, to your superior. It's also sent to your subordinates. 
um, if you if you, if you have uh, people you are managing, it's also sent to other bosses in other departments, and um, so you have. And this is what what is meant with the 360. Um, they are also assessing you when it comes to each of those uh, criteria, and um, then you have an interesting um, uh, report later because. Um, for example, when it comes to the first um, element of the first planet, uh, for example, you see you score yourself a three and then how um, are you being seen by your peers? And probably by your peers you're being seen as 2.9 or 2.8, 2.7. So that's, this is kind of similar, you don't have a big issue here. But also um, maybe your bosses, they see you as a 3.9, which is quite a substantial. So people are seeing you in a more positive light than you see yourself with respect to this planet. Um, what is most interesting is, of course, if there is a, a mismatch, which is um, which is greater than uh, half a point. Um, so this can be seen as a big mismatch, a discrepancy to the positive or to the negative. And in particular, it is interesting where, for example, you score yourself a four, um, but you are seen by others at probably as, as 2.7 or 2.9 and um, this is interesting because in particular to look at that so where you have a more positive view of yourself and is this view shared by your peers is it shared by your bosses is it shared by your subordinates is it shared by other more senior people in the organization so you get a very very good feedback um, when it comes to your performance your uh, strength as they are being seen by others and um, when we had international meetings, we had a, a very nice, uh, very simple tool. Uh, we had a nice uh, questionnaire and in, in this questionnaire, everybody was getting 10, 20 sheets of paper. Let's assume we're having 30 people in the meeting, 30 people that are in, uh, at a conference. And every uh, person, so every, every participant is getting, I don't know, 10 sheets of paper, 10 sheets of paper. And um, I'm getting 10 sheets and I have to fill, um, not for every person in the room, but I can do that. And I have to fill out um, several sheets of paper and the sheets of paper, they're, they're looking like that. First, it says to, and then I write a name. I write to Peter. I'm filling one for Peter, to Peter. And then the, the second question is, this person should stop to. So what is my view? What should Peter stop doing? Right. Stop always interrupting or whatever. Right. Stop to and then there are three uh, three lines. Continue to was the next one. Continue to. And then three lines. And um, what uh, should the person start to do? So that's, of course, corresponding a little bit. And then I filled this out for Peter and Tom and Mary, Peter, Paul and Mary. <laughs> and um, and I'm not signing that. I'm not signing that. They're not, they don't know, unless they know my handwriting very, very uh, properly. Um, they don't know where, where, where it's coming from. And then uh, we are collecting. And then um, there are, for example, there are different kind of papers here uh, for Peter and Mary has only got one probably and and, 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 and and Tom has may have got uh, seven sheets of paper. This is a very, very simple um, way of uh, testing whether the self image you have is corresponding to uh, to some extent with the image that others have of you. So it is a very, very powerful tool. I love that. Um, because um, it perfectly illustrates how you're being seen by others. You can also do it next time uh, you're, you're having a party or you're meeting with some friends. You can do this as a kind of party, but probably it can be uh, it can be very, very difficult. Oh, I'm, I need to interrupt again. I, I'm sorry about that. Okay. So now uh, moving on to the next slide, we have that. Yes, um, appreciation of the person. Everyone needs appreciation. We, we said that we are longing for affirmation, for affirmation of our personality, of our self-esteem. Um, and if uh, we are not being recognized, it, some, some may feel this also perceive this as being an attack on the self-esteem. So ideal communication in this context means to be sensitive towards the needs of others. 
And um, this is, of course, what you what you cannot learn. Uh, it has to be inside of you. So it has to be some kind of a, um, individual trait that you are empathetic, that you are sensitive towards uh, the needs of others. Um, recognition of achievement. So any sincere, honest appreciation of performance of others strengthens their self-esteem. So it should not be Selbstwertgefühl, so German, it should be self-esteem. Uh, and sig significantly makes communication more successful. And what is uh, the most important thing is you can always find something that you can honestly appreciate when it, when it comes to the other persons. I was mentioning that before. Um, that is a quote coming from Einstein. And Einstein said, everybody is superior to me in one respect. Therefore, I shall never ever look down on any person on the planet, right? You should never ever look down at any person of the planet. Everybody is superior to me in one respect. Somebody can, I don't know, clean the windows better. Somebody can uh, play the piano uh, much better than I can do. Somebody can play better tennis. Uh, I'm, I'm better at um, this kind of stuff. And that is okay and that, that, that is fine. Um, so what is meant by that is um, you can honestly appreciate uh, if somebody did a good job, whether it's um, I don't know, a plumber, an electrician, an artist, um, uh, an actor, um, a student, uh, or a professor or whatever. Um, and, uh, and, and this is okay and this is important. So uh, it helps to, um, to also to steer the negotiation. Looking uh, again at the image or at the analogy of this uh, pool billiard game, it helps to steer the negotiation in, uh, in a positive direction. Transaction analysis is um, the next uh, the next part of our uh, session when it comes to here the basics. We're still talking about the basics, the psychological concepts of uh, successful uh, communication and negotiation in general. And um, to quickly sum up uh, the the contents again, um, first we're talking about all the. Um, psychological uh, concepts and uh, tools of successful negotiation and communication. And then we uh, spend the rest of the uh, semester um, on talking about the different kind of steps in the negotiation process. So really in a chronological order. So preparation and self-motivation, greetings phase, uh, needs analysis, etc., etc. But it's very important beforehand to know the psychological and theoretical concepts behind first in, in order to be um, in a better position to apply them and to understand the, uh, the concepts later. So another useful, uh, very, very um, interesting uh, concept of uh, communication has been coined and invented by Dr. Eric Berne. And Berne was an American psychiatrist and he wanted to illustrate what happens if two people come together uh, and when they're communicating. So basically it was, um, but uh, this was more seen from a, a medical uh, perspective, him being a psychiatrist. But uh, nevertheless, it is also a, a, an interesting model in the, in the same connotation, in the same framework as uh, the Schulz von Thun model. And he said, I want to illustrate better what happens on the relationship level between the participants uh, in a conversation. So um, he was a bit like, uh, you can consider this model as being zooming in to the relationship level and analyzing what is happening uh, underneath the surface. And um, he states that every uh, a transaction is always the verbal and nonverbal exchange between two persons. So you have this also this uh, one cannot not communicate. You have this Watzlawick in here as well consisting of a stimulus, so that is a question or some, some uh, exclamation, and a reaction, some kind of response, verbally or non-verbally, between, and this is, uh, this is kind of new, between different kind of ego states. Because the transaction analysis assumes that there are three personality types that exist in all of us and they can prove to be relevant to specific ego states. One is uh, the parent ego, then there is the childhood ego and the adult ego. Um, so it's a bit like um, it, it's based on the psychology of Freud and Jung, who said that you have this um, 
it and the um, the over uh, das s das ich das über ich so the different kind of um, stages here but here it's a bit uh, it's a bit difficult but uh, it can be compared to this kind of a model so the childhood ego is symbolized um, using a c for child and Berner called it the archaeopsyche um, archaeopsyche um, all of our genes are there drives talents abilities this condition which is shown here as this circle with a C um, and is uh, abbreviated with a, with a car for kind, uh, for, uh, that's German one, or C for child. It, it is manifested in three different forms, as we know children. So it can be natural, so temperamental, playful, spontaneously. Uh, it can be adjusted. So this is more the submissive, the obedient, yes, Yes, okay, I do what you say. Or it can be, as we know children can be as well, it can be rebellious, defiant, insolent, self-pitying. Um, the second uh, ego uh, state is called parent ego, P for parent, and Banner calls it exterior psyche. Um, it is all that children have derived from their parents. Any kind of help, protection, wisdoms, morals, uh, but also exhortations, commands, prohibitions, ideas of how to react in life, of how you should, um, what you should do, what is, um, what is a good citizen. Um, so the parent ego has two main as aspects here, not three as the child. So one is critical, judgmental, moralizing, and the other one being caring. And the last one is the adult ego. The adult ego a for adult is called by uh, by Bernet neo psyche it's a comparable it's it can be compared to a computer which is processing facts of reality so perceptions of reality and it checks the input from parents and the childhood's ego for appropriateness so is this in line with my, my expectation level or how should i um, behave. So the adult ego only permits the norms and value orientations from the parent ego that appear adequate in the present and allows those parts of the childhood ego where the situation is appropriate. So the adult ego is always factual, informative, determinative and analytical. And now why is that good? Why is, that, is this helpful and who is using that? We are using this tool in particular, this transaction analysis, when it comes to mediation, when it comes to mediation. So whenever there are conflicts, um, for example, between two partners um, being being married, right? Um, or between, um, I don't know, a company and uh, the works council um, and, and the one, one, uh, one party is longing for higher, um, higher salaries and the other party is saying, no, we cannot do this in, in, in this time of a crisis. And there is a quarrel and there's a conflict. Mediation and mediators um, are, used, are used and they themselves are using and applying the transaction analysis model to better understand um, the different levels of communication. And it, it looks like that. Um, so the child ego, uh, okay, we, we, we talked about that. That is a bit repetition here. Uh, we said the child ego, adult ego, parent ego. Um, let's look at an example. I, I wanted to discuss the example. That's, um, that's more appropriate. So this is an old example. It's actually coming from, uh, from Bernheim. Um, exercise to determine the ego states. So um, now type into the chat function, I open that so we can better have a look at that what um what the, the people are saying and from from uh, which perspective they are being talking so an employee m comes into the office of her boss and she she says here's the report so that's a, a, quite an old example but nevertheless it's it's uh, it's not uh, it's not so important um so what is she doing she deals with the fact here's the report so what from which kind of ego state is she uh, is she corresponding what is what is what is her ego state at the moment she starts initially the conversation is it the parent yes adult um so 
she's um, talking from the adult level and addressing the adult level of her boss. Now, what is he doing? Um, that is impossible. That's a mess. With these reports, you always need to make three carbon copies. You see, it's, it's an old example. Uh, this is how we always do that. What is he doing? What is he doing? Now looking at the, he's talking from the parent and, and, and yes, the parent ego and which ego state is he addressing? He's, he's moralizing. Which ego state of her? Yes, he's addressing the, um, the child, uh, the child. Correct. And what is she responding? She's responding. I'm impossible. So, uh, I'm ashamed. Uh, Mrs. Müller told me this before. I forgot it again. Well, where is she responding from? From which kind of ego state? Yes. Yes. Obedient child. And he, what is he doing? It's all right. No need to berate yourself as the work is well done. He's comforting her. And um, what, what we are doing? One moment here um, and transaction analysis is then uh, in order to illustrate communication, complex communication processes. Um, um, the communication is illustrated by using different kind of uh, circuits here. So that's one person, for example, here, the, the, the M and the uh, and the C. And she's trying to communicate here and um, so this is not this example, this is another example, but um, every time that um, somebody, for example, I'm, I'm, is corresponding from the parent or from the adult to the adult here, and then if somebody is answering from another ego state, then the one which is expected, communication suffers. So for example, in our example, I'm going back to this one here. Here, um, we said that um, at the beginning, we have this, uh, one moment, take this away. So, um, adult, parent, child, adult, parent, child. So she's um, communicating like that and he he's saying oh this is impossible so he's answering from a different ego state and is addressing the child um and what is what is she doing she's she could of course say oh how you talk how you're talking to me right are you are you are you insane yeah uh, i'm not a child so he she could have responded like that and then communication would be suffering or um, she could also res uh, respond it like that and then um, always you have a mismatch and then communication suffers of course so um, taking this back but if the person is responding from the same kind of status uh, same kind of ego state which is being addressed then communication can get back on on, uh, on track again. If she would have responded um, in, uh, in a way like that, which is understandable, um, then you have, of course, a conflict, uh, which is very, very difficult to, uh, to resolve. Um, because once, like we said, once the ball is going into a certain kind of direction, which is then negative, it is very, very difficult to get back on track because the self-esteem suffered. And, uh, and then, um, it is very very complicated to uh, to uh, to work back and uh, to get back on track. May uh, or maybe she knows how to use this analysis. That is why she agrees. Yes yes yes. Um, I think it's a clever model. Yes it is, and it is. Um, you have to go uh, to Google that and uh, look a little bit deeper. Um, and this is also what we are using in uh, our Rosenberg. Rosenberg, um, he's a very famous um, uh, yeah, writer, author, uh, researcher, professor, uh, when it comes to um, via um, uh, less, 
what, what, is, what is the English word for that? Um, Violence-free communication, gewaltfreie Kommunikation, look for Rosenberg. And all those people, they're working with this kind of a model. And we are using this, or this is being used in uh, psychiatrist um, uh, offices. Um, this is also used, like I said, when it comes to um, conflict between parties or political, can be also conflict between nations. And you need somebody else to go to go in and, and analyze that. So it is very, very good and, and sophisticated model to understand where the other person is coming from. And um, it, it is not helping um, to always backfire from a different kind of status, like said, or how do you dare talking to me like this, uh, etc. So then you are taking the self-esteem, then um, uh, the whole uh, communication process basically also um, can be destroyed or can be tarnished in such a way that it can never be um, be, um, be coming back on track. So like uh, we said that before, um, there is no second chance um, for the first impression. So if somebody has got um, a negative impression of you um, and because he or she feels like you're not respecting her or because you're always criticizing her and attacking her self-esteem, etc., whatever, whatever, is the reason is not important but once this occurred once this happened um, the halo effect works uh, in a negative context um, the same as it works in a positive context so you remember the halo effect um, the uh, the noise of the closing door which says oh it's very solid so the car is very good so it can also be very very negative so we always we said that we always interpret the world and other persons in the same kind of way so the practical implication for business is if you have for example a sales representative um, who is uh, handling with certain kind of key man key account managers and um, I don't know he's not increasing sales and there are complaints about him or her or whatever um, it is it would be good not to fire him but to um, to have a different kind of assignment, to have different kind of key managers, different kind of um, sales representatives dealing with this kind of customer, because it is very difficult, like I said, once the climate, once the relationship is tarnished, to get back um, to normal, to get back to a positive one. There was one question here, Professor, uh, how we define the ego of a person where there's a lack of knowledge, but it's hard to admit. Um, so, yeah, what do you mean with um, there's a lack of knowledge um, in a certain kind of field, right? You, you, you mean that uh, somebody is, I don't know, asking questions um, about a certain kind of topic that he or she hasn't understood. She's just, um, no, um, then this person is just asking probably or inquiring from, um, from an adult perspective. Uh, but it depends, it depends again how my answer is being perceived by the other person, how I come across. If I'm coming across too much as a kind of a, a teacher, so I'm, um, I'm elevating myself um, as, um, as being the professor, as being the more, um, the more genius, the expert, right? And I'm looking, or the other person gets the feeling that I'm looking down at her, um, then, she might get the impression that I'm addressing the child, um, the child level, right? And that I'm trying to, um, to teach her. Um, but th this is uh, also can be very, very counterproductive because if this person inquiring uh, something from an adult perspective and I'm addressing or she feels that I'm addressing her child ego, then the relationship suffers, of course. Um, yeah, then you come across as being arrogant, right? Yeah, we, I think uh, we have to get experience through talking to many people around you and letting know your thought process. Yeah, of course. Next time, um, I think you will improve uh, every time um, you're thinking about how, how is what you're saying, how is that or how this may be perceived by the other person. And the more you start thinking about that, the more successful communication uh, will become. So I, I love that model. It's a very, very useful model. Here, it's the same kind of um, example as Schultz von Thun uh, was giving. In the example here, it's green ahead of you. Am I driving? Are you? 
Um, a factual message is transmitted from the adult ego to the adult ego. However, this message contains a carrying reminder with a parent toning. And so um, this model, the transaction analysis model, goes a little bit deeper and better explains than the Schultz von Thun model what is happening on the relationship level. Um, and because it also subdivides the relationship level and the different kind of ego states into different kind of sub elemental um, sub element states like um, the uh, child can be rebellious, it can be obedient, it can be playful. So different kind of um, stages here. And the better we understand where the other person is coming from or what is her perception or his perception about which ego state is being addressed, I can better tailor that. And I can be more successful. So um, basically, there are three um, states here, types of transaction, according to Bernier. Uh, one is the complementary, the simple transaction. These transactions are always in parallel in the sense that the reaction of the person addresses, uh, being addressed comes from the expected ego state. A complementary transaction, therefore, uh, exists even if it is successfully communicating diagonally across the different egos. So the, chick, the sick child here asked for a glass of water which the caring mother brings. So this is um, a so-called um, uh, a productive way of uh, communication here. Uh, so there is no conflict involved. Cross transaction, this is unequal wavelength communication. The ego states are no longer complementary, but are different because the respective expected ego state is active. And there also may be so-called complicated hidden transactions. So this exists when different ego states are involved. And uh, whenever this is the case, um, communication suffers. In the transaction analysis, we have a, diff, uh, a very important unit of, um, of recognition, a very important um, aspect, which is called a stroke. A stroke. It's like um, a unit of recognition. <laughs> it's not a stroke uh, in, in, in baseball. It's called, it's, it's called a stroke. It's a unit of recognition, and it's very important for, uh, for the communication. A stroke is defined as a unit of perception or unit of recognition. So every time you signal to another person uh, using any kind of communicative act and uh, you indicate and the other person understands that you perceive it uh, in the right way, right? This is a kind of a stroke. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying. Okay. Mm -hmm. So strokes are absolutely necessary for a person's physical and psychological survival. Interestingly, any kind of reaction, positive or negative, um, is a stroke. And better negative strokes than none at all. So we know this probably uh, if you are, I don't know, um, if you have a partner, um, the worst thing you can do um, if, if you're in a quarrel, the worst thing you can do, just walk away. So you don't say anything at all. You just walk away. You don't even shut the door or whatever you just run out of the house or run out of the flat or apartment this is the worst thing um, you can do because uh, better a negative stroke than none at all um, we need also negative uh, negative feedback uh, it's better than no feedback at all so all behavior is uh, more or less influenced modified and prevented by strokes so any confrontation with a person any kind of reaction so, and um, this is a terminology or a very simple, uh, very simple uh, model here, Matrix by Harris. Harris is a psychologist who wrote a very famous book, which is called I'm OK, You Are OK. And um, of course, it is also not OK um, here to talk about yourself as being not OK, to demote yourself um, from your perspective and say, I'm not OK, but you are OK. So this is not an appropriate state as well as all the others. So, um, of course, I'm okay, you are okay is the, um, is the best, uh, best state to achieve, of course. And if the other person gets the feeling that you think of yourself as being okay, as being the one who's in charge and who's, who's got all the answers and the only right answers, and uh, he or she has nothing to contribute, um, then she doesn't, or he doesn't feel okay, 
uh, then communication suffers as well. So it is uh, in line with the communication analysis um, to say that um, you should never signal to the other person that he or she is not is not okay or that her perception of reality is a false one. It should be always like we talked about that when we looked at the dolphins, when we looked at the old women and the young women, every perspective of reality is possible. It's not the only one, but these are possibilities and you should not ignore that. You should appreciate that and um, you shouldn't attack, uh, attack the other one uh, for that. Oh, that th this scenes, oh, there's a, a translation error. It says, um, defense strategies uh, in the context of the transaction analysis so in the i'm i'm not okay you are not, uh, you're okay dimension there's a risk that a feels threatened by b so that a defense is caused in this case four variants can be distinguished so make yourself even smaller that is give up the fight which is not which is not a good one active make yourself look bigger that is adopt a shame size or passive Withdraw oneself, for example, to escape the battle. So in this context, and that is very important to understand, to stress as to put an emphasis on that, the size you adopt cannot be used as leverage. It takes you over. So a strength that you show and demonstrate to the other person you don't possess. That is very important to understand. I say it again, a strength which you show or overtly show to the other person, which you put an emphasis on, you don't possess, right? Um, so otherwise you come across as uh, trying to elevate yourself um, uh, up to a higher level um, as seen from the other person and then communication suffers as well. So it should always be uh, coming across as communication among equals um, in, the, in the ideal case. Right. So the ideal is always the I'm OK, you're OK position for the optimal communication. So what is the learning? What is the take uh, takeaway from the uh, transaction analysis? It is that optimal communication um, is not the self-esteem of the other person you're talking to, not the needs of the other, understand the transaction and also understand the position and do not react to defensive tactics with defensiveness yeah you should always try to um, accomplish try to achieve this i'm okay you okay status okay um so we have a couple of more minutes and i want to talk a little bit about uh, motivation um theory uh, the ideal way to communicate is to motivate the other correctly and what is correctly um, a motive is something that drives an organism to do what it needs to do to bring it closer to a certain kind of goal, whether it's an individual goal or a company's goal or an organization's goal. Motivation refers to the attractive design, presentation and interpretation of need satisfying options for influencing needs, for motives, right? So, and... Um, Basically, there are two uh, kinds of motives, and you're all aware of that, the differentiation between intrinsic and extrinsic uh, motivation. Um, so intrinsic motivation is coming from the inside of the person. It is uh, based on self-realization. It is about meaning. It, it can be achieved through extended scope of action. And extrinsically is, for example, money. So. Um, Therefore, it is, it is a proven psychological fact that just giving more money to people is motivating them. Yes, but it's like a, like a candle or like a match, which is, which is highly, uh, highly lighting up, but then it is extinguished. Then it's going away, it's fading. Uh, and then the effect is not sustainable. It's not long term. So um, that is very important to understand. And we talked about that before when I was... Um, telling you about the story of, um, I think I, we talked about that, this um, talents and strength and uh, weaknesses and uh, Herbert von Karajan, I think I talked about that. So um, the more people are intrinsically motivated, of course, the better, the better it is. Oh, that's a no-brainer, of course, everybody knows that. But how to intrinsically motivate people? Um, you can only intrinsically motivate people if you, if you make them feel that they are part of the solution. 
Uh, yeah, everybody is same in sales. Everybody likes to buy, but nobody likes the feeling that something is sold to him. Everybody likes to buy clothes or sneakers or whatever. But if um, uh, a salesperson in a shop or online or whatever is too aggressive and, and, and something comes across as being too, I don't know, too much a sales approach, right? Um, we don't like that feeling and, and, and we better not buy. Um, the best thing that has ever been written about um, motivation is coming from the author of um, The Little Prince, Saint Antoine uh, d'Exupéry. And Exupéry, um, he said, if you, um, I don't know whether I quoted that before, but uh, if you want to build a ship, um, don't, assemble uh, don't assemble men, don't delegate tasks, don't let them collect wood, but teach them the longing for the endless ocean. That is a lovely quote. It is a fantastic uh, quote. It's full of wisdom. Because if I just assign tasks to people, I tell people what to do, right? Uh, I'm not motivating them. I'm coming across as being the boss of somebody, as being superior to somebody. But I'm not really leading them. I'm not a leader. Uh, that is the difference between a leader um, and somebody just being superior to people. Just giving orders to people is not is not leading them. It's not a leader. But a leading is more to recognize what is the individual strength and what are the talents that somebody possesses and how, as a manager, as a leader, how can I capitalize on his or her talents to get the job done? I'll give you one example. So instead of... Um, telling Peter, uh, let's, uh, let's take Peter for example, and say, ah, please um, organize until next week with the agency, organize the uh, promotional activities for our retail sites. It is, it is much more intrinsically motivating to tell Peter, Peter, I realized last time that you did a fantastic job with the agency in uh, organizing um, the sales promotion event in, uh, in India. And uh, because of that, I would suggest that uh, you're responsible with the agency to organize um, the, uh, the upcoming sales promotions events um, for our shampoo launch in Pakistan. And you know that this is a very crucial part of the overall success of the project. And um, therefore, I think you're the best one. Uh, to take over this kind of responsibility. So this is a uh, this is doing a couple of things. Uh, this is first recognizing the other person's um, uh, personality and talents and strength. This is also um, ele elevating. It is it is um, it is increasing the self esteem of the other person. I honestly uh, acknowledge his uh, his job he has done in the past with respect to this kind of task. And then I'm. Um, Combining, I'm aligning um, this strength with the task I'm assigning to him. And the fourth thing I'm doing, I'm showing what is the impact of his contribution to the greater whole. So he's, he, he's likely to be feeling much more intrinsically motivated than, um, than, uh, than if I just tell him, please do the uh, promotional activity planning until the uh, until the end of next week with the um with the agency so we can go over that everybody is familiar with that the stage theory of maslow uh, we can uh, quickly go over that but um that is um to conclude that is important when it comes to motivating and uh, communication optimal communication always means not ignoring the needs of others so i can motivate somebody by addressing one of the unmet need unmet needs and show him how he can achieve this through his actions. So whenever um, the other person understands or sees what is in for him by following my suggestions, he or she feels uh, much more intrinsically motivated and then the motivation is coming from, from the inside. So the better one can imagine that the target situation um, the more motivated he or she is. What can we do to do to accomplish that? First, we need to recognize each other's needs, define which need satisfaction is the goal, and then suggest the behavior that brings best one to his destination. 
Um, so whenever you, um, you show somebody how your proposal help him or her achieve his goals, the more successful communication becomes. Okay, and that is a different, uh, different topic uh, that, we, that would be too much, uh, too much going into depth now, but um, we'll do this um, in, our, in our next session. Uh, I stay, of course, I stay a cu couple of minutes in the line uh, to answer your questions and um, to discuss things, but I now I end the, uh, the next part of our um, recording here. Thanks very much, and I look forward to uh, talking to you again. Cheers. Bye-bye.